What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. Amron and Best Ball Summer is very much underway. We have BBM4 already on Underdog Fantasy, the biggest fantasy football contest ever. We have the Chihuahua but Superflex. We have the Dalmatian. Of course, if you are new, use promo code RON to sign up on Underdog Fantasy. They will match your deposit up to $100. I'll have a link down below in the description and a link in the comment section down below. But I assume that a lot of you guys out there that have used my promo code are new to the site feel a little bit overwhelmed right like there's so many different contests to choose now you have the weekly winner stuff and i kind of wanted to make a video for i would say like the beginner to intermediate range where i want to break down everything that i know about tournaments on underdog fantasy just how underdog fantasy works what i'm thinking about what i think your priorities should be stacking week 17 stuff adp so we're going to break it all down i'm literally going to give you everything that i know everything that i think through when i'm drafting these teams so you guys can go out there and draft your best BBMs, puppies, whatever you guys want to get into. I just want to make sure you guys are equipped to go in there and be strong, you know, in those lobbies. So with all that being said, if you enjoy this video, make sure down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's go. Now, before we even break down underdog fantasy, I kind of want to give you guys an idea of where I'm coming from and what my experience on underdog fantasy is, right? Because if I'm not playing, if my skin's not in the game, then what do I really know? Now, I can't sit here and tell you that I've won, you know, one of the big ones, right? We, we have a ring. I could bring it out. I'll bring it out real quick. Hold on. Hold on. But we have a ring. Um, I won it on one of the weekly contests, right? So we're not really dealing with anything too crazy. Um, but it does look pretty cool, and it's a nice little thing to have. I would like to get another one um, this offseason. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I play a bunch. If we look here, it'll show you that, you know, I already have, like, 250 drafts done for 2023. So you guys can see 152 pre-draft, 95 normal post-draft, two super flex. We're going to keep adding to that. Um, and if we look at what I did last year, you know, we were profitable. We did again. We didn't take anything down. That was pretty crazy. I have a video that I'll probably tag here where you can like click on in the top right. But I went through all of my winnings and losses from the 2022 season uh, in a separate video. But we did okay on underdog. We had what is this? Two, four, five, six, nine teams make the semifinals. We didn't have anybody alive in week 17. The way that the we're gonna get into it in a little bit. The way that the playoffs work in these tournaments is you have. Week 15, week 16, week 17. Week 16 is the semifinals. You can see we had a bunch of semifinals teams. We came up just short, though. Like, this was our this was our closest BBM. Second place. Literally, if <clears throat> Trey Lance is healthy the entire year, we probably have a team alive in week 17. If Justin Fields can give me more than 9.86 points in the final week, we're probably looking good. But as you can see, I have, like, the red badge there, which means – I think it means I've done over 1,000 drafts. So – I've seen some things. I haven't taken down the biggest contest, but I can at least give you my experience as somebody that plays a lot of volume on underdog and does okay. <clears throat> and I want to sort of just give you guys everything that I have learned from the past. Like I would say like three years that I've been playing this uh, for real on underdog. So when we talk about underdog, what even is underdog? It is a best ball platform where you start most of the time one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receiver, one flex, one tight end, 10 bench spots. And the idea of best ball is that it's a half PPR format on underdog. And every single week it goes through and it sets your best lineup. Like if we look at this team right here, this is from week 16. So anything that doesn't have a zero is what underdog counted, right? So Justin Fields was my quarterback that week. Uh, Eckler and Saquon were my two running backs. My flex was Leonard Fournette. Uh, we had Waddle. We had Drake London. And we had Byron Pringle as our three wide receivers, which is pretty brutal. Uh, and then a huge George Kittle spike week. So that's what your team looks like each and every single week. And it counts up over the entire span of a season. Now, now that we understand that it's underdog what, or what best ball is, you have to decide what kind of contest you want to play. Now, we said earlier we're going to talk through tournaments. But when you go to this contest tab... It's a little bit overwhelming. Like, again, like you see so much. You see Bestlemania 4. You see the Dalmatian 2, the Scott Fishbowl Satellite. You see normal $3 drafts below that. Now, I think your normal $3 drafts are probably fine uh, if you were a beginner. I used to play a bunch of these. Uh, but what turned me off of them is it's just like it's just not a ton of upside. Like, 
it, you can do it for the love of the game, you know, grinding $3 drafts for a $20 payout, but it's just not a ton of upside, right? Like, you could have drafted a team, and this is what happened to me. I would say my first year really playing on underdog, I split a 50-50, right? I had about half of my money uh, in these little small $3, $5, $10 drafts, and then the other half in, like, BBMs and puppies and everything. And what ended up happening was is I would look at my normal teams, and I would just have an absolute behemoth, right? Like, in that year, it was, like, Debo and Deontay, um, and Mark Andrews and just like a cracked team, but all you get at the end of the day is twenty dollars. So you could have had a team last year in one of these three dollar contests: Jalen Hurts, Josh Jacobs, Justin Jefferson, Travis Kelsey, all of the guys you needed to win last year, and all you get is twenty dollars. When maybe if that team was drafted in the BBM or in the Puppy, it would have won thousands. Now, of course, it's not going to be the same draft rooms or whatever, but I would just rather have all of my drafts have that upside. Uh, upside now. The other side is your tournament, so your upside structure. And the one that we're going to go through, just for the sake of example of like how a tournament works, I know that some people, they come down there like, what is a fantasy football tournament? So this is just for an example, but this was the Pomeranian last year. So it's that same dollar entry value. It's $3 to enter, and this is how a tournament usually works. It's $3 to enter. With the Pomeranian, it's $5,000 up top to first place. But this is how roughly every tournament is right it's it's a very similar structure to this we're just using the pomeranian as this example but the pomeranian the chihuahua the poodle the puppy it's all very very similar now with the pomeranian all of these tournaments are split into rounds like this so round one is weeks one through 14 which is just your 12-man league now it says here at the end of round one the top four performing entries in each group will advance to round two and be awarded a prize as described below Round two will consist of 5,560 entries and 556 10 person groups. Now, some tournaments might be like top four, it might be top one. This one, it's the top four. So, the top four within your 12 man league advance. Now, you all go into your separate 10 team pods. In round two, the top three performing entries from each group, which is going to be each of those 10 person pods, then advances. Then we have round three, which is going to take place week 15. And the top two performing entries from each of those groups will advance to round four, which then round four is going to be week 17. And then it's just the top scoring teams in that week. So the way that you want to think about it is round one is weeks one through 14. Round two is week 15. Round three is week 16. Round four is week 17. And the entire time there's some kind of, you know, top two to three teams advance. And it just kind of whittles down every single team on a weekly basis, kind of chops off the fat. And then you have your final of it says round four there's going to be a grand prize winner of a 278 person group uh in that final week now when we kind of compare the pomeranian versus a normal three dollar entry this is kind of how uh that breaks down and you can see here versus the pomeranian or versus the three dollar entry um kind of how it breaks down and what uh, what you're really getting from an roi perspective now i broke it down they're both three dollar entries um, if you win, if you finish top three in your 12-man league, Pomeranian, all you get is four dollars back. Uh, in terms of like your your average outcome, first overall in your 12-person league, twenty dollars in the three-dollar draft, only four dollars in the Pomeranian. So you're not really getting rewarded for winning in that first 12-person pod, right? But from each point forward, you're making money on the Pomeranian advancing from weeks, you know, 15, 16, 17, where if you then advance to round two, right? Advancing to round two is just winning your uh, 12-man league, essentially. So that's going to be $4. You advance to that next week, your average winning is going to be $8. You advance to round four, which is the final, your average winning is $83. So that is 10 times more than if you made it to round three. And that's also four times more than if you just won a normal 12-person league. And that's just if you make it to the final. Your average payday is going to be four times what you would win if you just won first place of a normal 12 person league. And then from there, an average top 100 finish is $179. A top 25 finish is going to be $566. A top 10 finish, $1,200. First place, $5,000. Now, if you just simply take <clears throat> prizes divided by entrance, you have an expected value of $3 for the Pomeranian. You have an expected value of $2.67 for the $3 draft. So across the board, you're probably better off running up these tournaments if you're just going to you know jam three dollar five dollar entries at least from where i'm sitting so i personally love the tournaments you can play for that max max upside where if you draft a one in a million team which you know there's millions of people drafting on the platform why not you you have the upside to win more money and be rewarded for drafting a really sick team so again 
if you're new to the platform, a lot of these tournaments are structured like this. The Puppy, the Chihuahua, the Poodles, the Pomeranians. If I was new to the platform, wanted to get my feet wet. I get this question all the time. I'm new on Underdog. What should I be getting into? I would hang around and I would go on the Puppies. I would go on the Pomeranians, the Poodles, the Chihuahuas. Pretty much anything that's like $11 and below and just blast off in those tournaments. Just, I mean, maybe not max them, but again, just jam them when they're on the marketplace so like right now you have the chihuahua but super flex if i was new to underdog fantasy and wanted to you know play low stakes i would be jamming that right now i'd be waiting for the next chihuahua waiting for the next puppy playing in those low stakes tournaments with the high upside now that we know what underdog is what contests i'm playing now it's time to talk through drafting and just kind of what i'm thinking about in terms of importance when i'm drafting i think the most important thing to be considering in this entire thing is roster construction and positional allocation. I think a lot of people, including myself in the past, have gotten hung up on, you know, zero RB, hero RB, double hero RB, you know, labeling your draft strategy. And I think when you're drafting teams, it shouldn't be so much, you know, I'm going to force this team now after this is honestly what I would have told you last year where, okay, through three rounds, this team's going to look like a zero RB team or look like a hero RB team, but it really shouldn't be, you know, looking to fit your team into one specific label you should just be drafting through the idea of positional allocation because draft strategies change every single year in terms of their success rate. Zero RB smashed last year. In 2021, zero RB wasn't a good draft strategy. And in 2020, it was okay. This was a study that I think Hayden Winks did over on Underdog. No one particular draft strategy is really the end-all be-all. It's just going to be in a given year. One might be better than the other, but you should be generally speaking drafting your teams from the mindset of positional allocation. Now, what does that even mean? It means we should be focused on upside, right? You can't be drafting for floor. You can't be drafting just to get like third place. It's a tournament. You need to get first place. So you have to start drafting as if you were right, which means <clears throat> when you're thinking about positional allocation, you have to think about budgeting, right? If you start off a draft with three straight running backs, you can't end up with like seven total. Because only three running backs can start at a time, right? Two running backs and one flex spot. And if you win it all because, or what I'm trying to say is that if you win it all at all to begin with, it's because those top three running backs that you drafted were good, not because you drafted a bunch of depth behind them in case of things go wrong. Because if you start drafting in case of things go wrong, then things are going to go wrong with your team. And it's not built for that one in a million outcome where if you just draft it as if you were right and as if this team smashes on all ends, you're maximizing the kind of upside that your team could be. Now, this is a idea that I believe was put together kind of by uh, Pat Corrine, who won BBM3. And he says to kind of look at it like an auction. And I absolutely love that. You only have so much draft capital you can spend on each position, right? So if you spend your first three picks on running back, you have to make up so much ground elsewhere. You can't just hammer a bunch late. You can't just end up with seven running backs after you take three high, right? This is the way that you kind of have to think through it. You're either drafting quality early or you're drafting quantity late. So if you draft three running backs early, you really can't afford to then draft running backs in the middle rounds and the later rounds and end up with like six, seven, eight running backs. You have to think, you know, you only have a certain amount of draft capital that you can spend at each position. So once you get an elite player at a position, you have to start thinking about, you know, how many, how, how much more resources can I devote to this position until it's overkill, until I'm taking too much from wide receiver or tight end or quarterback and vice versa the same way, right? If you start a draft with seven straight wide receivers, you don't have to end up with 11. You could probably cut it off right at seven um, if you go like a really heavy zero RB. So you have to be thinking through that, right? Thinking through that, you know, looking at, my, looking at my wide receivers, three start every week, one flex. You don't need to have 10 wide receivers if you take a bunch early. So you have to really be thinking about, you know, am I, are these wide receivers, are these running backs going to see the lineup? Am I drafting this team to, you know, utilize as much of its roster space as possible or is there going to be players that are you know dev pieces that just aren't going to show up in the lineup because I drafted too many good players ahead of them so you have to really think through right you shouldn't be drafting three quarterbacks if you draft Josh Allen in the in the second round just think through it like that where you only have so much auction budget or draft capital budget for each position and if you spend too much then they're going to pull the weight of the team and make one of your other positions too weak for you to succeed. Now, when we get to the actual, you know, nooks and crannies of roster construction, we have to have that mindset of budgeting for your positions. And I think this is a great graphic from TJ Hernandez, where he does great work. Um, 
And this is sort of showing the advance rate over expectation from Best Ball Mania showing each roster construction. So the three that were over expectation all three years were the 2673, the 2682, the 2583, the 3573. And then you have a bunch in the middle uh, that are also viable. And I think it just shows a lot can work. I also think that the team that won last year was actually a 3582 um, by Pat Corain. And that's one of the ones that's way on the bottom. So you really can win. However, it's really about being within your draft room and drafting smart. Now, I think that this at least gives you kind of a bumper rail in terms of drafting, where if you look through here, you probably want to keep it between... Now, when we talk about the rest of the video, we're going to talk through... It's going to be 18 rounds, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end is kind of like, you know, 2582 or 2592 would be quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. So just think through it like that. But you can kind of see where you want the bumper rails here, where quarterback should be between two to three, running back should be between three to seven, wide receiver should be like six to 11, and tight end should be like two to four. Now, four tight end builds are kind of controversial where there's not a big sample, but the small sample that has been tested, it's, it's shown up pretty well. Uh, I know Sam Sherman's done a good uh, little Twitter thread recently where he said that four tight end teams are viable, but three tight end teams outperform four tight end teams anyway, so you don't really need to add the fourth one, but they're both viable. So just things to, to think through in terms of looking from a macro perspective, what teams should be looking like. And just one last thought on that as well. If let's say you're drafting six to 11 wide receivers, if you have a draft where you start four wide receivers early, then you're going to end up more towards six than you are 11, right? Like just the amount of draft capital you spend early on each position will kind of point you towards how many you want to end up with, right? So again, if you go elite tight end, you probably want to end up with two tight ends. If you wait until, oh, geez, dude. My own alarm, my own alarm is, gonna, is going to interrupt me in front of my own video, man. Insane. But like I said, six to, if you're staying within six to 11 wide receivers, how you know, like, oh, how many wide receivers should I end up? You just have to kind of feel it out based on how many you took early. You know, how are your other positions doing? You just have to kind of think through your team as this like, living breathing thing where you can't spend too much at one certain position and you really have to flatten things out a little bit now of course you want to keep in mind positional allocation with these in mind too right the budgeting aspect right like we look at the top build the two six seven three it's the best build according to the table but if you waited until round 17 and 18 to take your two quarterbacks it's dead if you took five straight running backs it's dead uh if your three tight ends are your first three picks right let's say you go like kelsey andrews uh hawkinson or something weird your team's dead. So you have to think of it as in 2673 build is good, but through the lens of budgeting it correctly. Like a 2673 build, you probably want it to be sort of balanced. It can be a hero RB, uh, it can be a zero RB, but it's going to be kind of balanced. Uh, it's not going to be an elite tight end build. It's probably an elite quarterback build. And this is actually a 2673 team that I built in Best Ball Mania. It's a 2673 like that you know top roster construction and if i had to make a 2673 this is what it would sort of look like right so we started we stopped at two quarterbacks because i had lamar uh we went six running backs where we kind of went dobbins and then went really thin after that because we ended up with six total running backs which is a pretty decent amount uh and to kind of offset our lack of a running back too we ended up drafting six total running backs we went seven wider series because i feel pretty good about the top like four to five right and then you have some other guys sort of filtering in um, as flex spots and then three tight ends because our first tight end was outside of the top 100 picks so I would call this like a hero RB uh, 2673 but again you can draft a 2673 that has positive advance rates across the board and it can be zero RB you know you can get really weird with it within each build and I wouldn't again I, I wouldn't want to be like oh this team's going to be a hero RB with Bijan let's force a 2592 or a 2583 right you can kind of you can kind of mold it a little bit to your liking. And I think that's what's going to yield a really good result instead of sort of forcing yourself down a certain, you know, way. Because it doesn't matter a ton about, you know, the label of your team. It really just matters the positional allocation, the balance of your team. Can all of your positions kind of, you know, survive and thrive together in the best ball space? Now, when we have teams and positions and stuff, I did want to give one last thought on quarterbacks and tight ends because I think that that's a little bit more straightforward. Running backs and wide receivers, it's really tough for me to give you like a firm, okay, if I draft this running back first, it's going to be hero RB or zero RB. But this is kind of my look or my feel when I'm drafting tight ends. You can see here, 
Um, it's pretty straightforward, right? Because I do get that question all the time. It's like, okay, if you draft this quarterback, how many quarterbacks are you taking? This is my rough guide. This is my rough guide. Um, you don't have to follow it, um, but this is how I think through it. Now, the way that – I know that there's like chicken scratch here a little bit, but on the left-hand side, you have the top quarterbacks. If I draft from Justin Herbert to Patrick Mahomes as my QB1, I'm stopping at two. Nine out of ten times, right? So if I go Burrow and I go Kirk Cousins, that's enough for me. If I go Josh Allen, and if I go even if I go all the way down to like Sam Howell, that's usually enough for me. Um, and then if it's past that, if I take Trevor Lawrence, then I'm usually taking three, right? It might be Trevor Lawrence and two really, really late. It might be you know Tua and two late. It might be Anthony Richardson, Dak Prescott, and then somebody in the last round. It's probably gonna be something among those lines, especially because you have to think through the idea with three quarterbacks. The way that you make up ground on the elite tier of quarterback is by, we're going to talk about stacks in a little bit. I don't want to get it too ahead of ourselves, but the way that you kind of close the gap on those guys is if a team that has Josh Allen probably only has Josh Allen to the Stephon Diggs as like they're out to win it all. But you, if you have three quarterbacks with three different stacks, you can, you know, you have more bullets in the chamber than that Josh Allen team is what I'm trying to say. On the other hand, you have uh, tight ends here. If I take Kelsey or Andrews, I'm stopping at two tight ends no matter what. If I take Hawkinson through Darren Waller, I can stop at two, but I can also be talked into drafting three. And then if my first tight end is Evan Ingram and on, um, 100% drafting three more, three or more. Um, if I'm drafting f- tight ends as like my last pick, sometimes I'll do uh, around 15, 16, 17, 18, four tight ends uh, in a row. Now, next thing that we're going to talk about is stacking. Because as we move down, I think roster allocation... Uh, and roster construction, positional drafting uh, through budgeting is kind of your foundation, right? Just in terms of understanding that you can't just draft as many players at a certain position as you want in a row. And your team is this like living, breathing organism where you have to kind of treat it as a budget for all your positions. But moving after that, I think stacking and making correlation with your team is the next best thing. And when we talk about stacking, we'll just keep it simple in terms of quarterback to another teammate, it can be a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end. Just for simplicity's sake here, or sake here, you can see that last year, stacking your quarterback one with the wide receiver one gave you better advance rates in the playoffs, better semifinals rate, better finals rate, better average points on your team. So that's just like very simple. You can see stacking gives you a positive, you know, ROI from a macro standpoint. Now, again, this can be a running back, wide receiver, tight end. I would aim in a perfect world if I draft a tight end or if I draft a quarterback on a tournament team, on underdog, I would like to have one of their other teammates. You can go like one to two. If it's like a really high-powered offense like the Bills, you can go like three teammates if you'd like. You can go a little bit more than that. It becomes overkill unless it's a really high-powered offense that can kind of sustain all of that. Uh, But if not, I would keep it to like one to two teammates in a stack. And stacking has two forms of benefiting your team. You have the season-long macro outlook and you have the week-to-week micro outlook and i think that for season long jacob sanderson sums it up really well here we have him on the channel all the time but this is an article from way back when when he was writing on player profile that i still absolutely loved and he said you are tasked with arriving at a destination this is just to understand what stacking does for you from a season long standpoint and he said you are tasked with arriving at a destination within 10 minutes to which two roads diverge in a yellow wood Road A is marked by four sets of lights, each of which has a 50% chance of turning green or red upon your arrival. The light will remain the color it turns for two minutes. The the distance between each light requires two minutes of travel time. Road B has the same four set of lights, but rather than turning at random, the lights are synchronized such that if you reach the first light while it is green, all subsequent lights will be green thereafter. Of course, you would choose path B. The fastest possible time to reach your destination is still eight minutes, but the odds of reaching under under 10 are much better with the correlated set of lights. Now, he said, if that thought experiment didn't drive home the point for you fully, he linked an article, correlating outcomes is a benefit from a season-long perspective in any format to reduce the number of correct assumptions required to reach a ceiling outcome. However, the impact the best ball playoffs put put this particular uh, spotlight on the weekly asset on the weekly aspect, I don't know why I can't talk. In addition to the work on stacking my previous place, I want to share some data compiled by myself. I'll probably link this down below. Um, But he makes a really good point there where... In the context of your underdog team, you want your outcomes to be correlated, right? If you draft your team with no correlations, you're you're essentially running an 18-leg parlay that you're hoping, you know, 12 of those 18 does all right for your team. But if you can start to minimize the amount of bets you have to get right, which is what you're doing. When you draft a player at ADP, you're drafting him at his price. You are making a bet that this player is going to outperform that price, right? So if Joe Burrow has an MVP season, 
Chase and Higgins likely smash at ADP. If Lamar Jackson has an ADP season, Mark Andrews likely also smashes. Same thing with Dobbins as well. Same thing with like what Mark Ingram did in 2019 during that MVP season. And if Christian Watson ends up being like a league winning top six fantasy wide receiver, Jordan Love likely outcomes his, or outperforms his ADP as well. So instead of you know treating your teams as this 18 leg parlay, you can kind of shrink it down to like a 10 to 12 by correlating your outcomes and kind of shrinking together the uncertainty. And now, again, this is an old article, but I think it still holds up that Jacob showed some really good examples of over these past few years when it comes to that stacking and really outperforming ADP in a massive, massive way. So you see the first one, you have Allen and Diggs, which I think is a great example, right? Josh Allen, QB 11, finished as QB 2. Diggs was wide receiver 27, finishes as wide receiver 3. And if you took Diggs and you didn't end up stacking him, you open yourself up to not fully maximizing that Stephon Diggs season, right? Because if you draft Josh Allen, they both outperform their ADP massively. Their spike weeks are going to sync up too, right? So if Stephon Diggs has a good game, Josh Allen likely has a good game. And that's going to make your team so much more dominant on a week-to-week basis where if you didn't stack him, you could have whiffed on the position, right? You could have went like Matt Ryan and Stephon Diggs and your team would have been much worse. I even looked back to Allen and Diggs among all quarterbacks and wide receivers in that 2020 season, they had the first and third highest win rate. So when you combine those onto one team, top three win rate players, no matter ADP, and they're also syncing up on a weekly basis, that's massive. Now, I think there's some other good examples in here too that are a little bit to a lesser scale, right? Herbert and Keenan Allen, you have Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, Lamar Jackson to Mark Andrews was, of course, a big one, Jameis Winston to Chris Godwin, Dak Prescott, Michael Gallup. Now, these are 2020 and 2019 examples. You could probably find some uh, from before then. Maybe I could think of one in my head, but I don't think I could. Um, but it just goes to show that when you draft two players over an entire season, if they're correlated, right, same offense, they have a, a higher outcome or a higher likelihood of both performing highly, right? Cause they, they affect each other's performance. Now there's a weekly correlation version of this, right? In 2023, if Stefan Diggs, right, this upcoming season, if Stefan Diggs has a 30 point bomb, Josh Allen also likely has a massive score. And I think Hayden Winks had a great article. We're just going to be pulling articles and graphics from everybody else. Please go check any of these guys out that I mentioned. But Hayden Winks does great work. And he had a great article on this. And I kind of highlighted colors where they match up. So I'll kind of show you what this is. Now, he had a really cool way of finding half EPR points over replacement. So we found like the replacement level uh, of each position and, you know, how much you overperform that. And then that's how much, you know, big of an impact a certain player had, right? The biggest spike weeks across every position. And when we look here at Josh Allen, Josh Allen has five on this list, right? The first one, week five. Week five, Josh Allen had his biggest spike week. Gabriel Davis had his biggest spike week. You can see week five right there, both in the green. And then Stephon Diggs had one of his bigger spike weeks that week. Now, the second Josh Allen, week 15, he was also stacked to or also correlated with Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox had his big game week 15, and it tied up with Josh Allen there. You can go week one. That's the third, you know, Josh Allen on this list. Him and Stephon Diggs in week one both went on or went off on this list. And you have week 12 where it was Josh Allen, Isaiah McKenzie, and Stephon Diggs. And you have week two, it was Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. So you can look through this chart. There's five times Josh Allen shows up on this table. And for each of them, he is a pass catcher as well that showed up on this list having a massive spike week. So as you can see, it's not even just the luxury stacks, right? So it's not even Josh Allen to Stephon Diggs. You can get weekly benefits from stacking a guy like Josh Allen with uh, Gabe Davis. You can get benefits from stacking even like last round wide receiver Isaiah McKenzie and Dawson Knox. They all line up and it's even really, I would even say better for last round stacks where you can go Josh Allen like this year, for example, you can go Josh Allen, like maybe close to Kerr where you can get a guy like close to Kerr and it kind of makes him a better late round pick if he is then synced up with one of your quarterbacks in terms of correlation uh so you can see like you can do like late round ones you can do uh double stacks too right where uh josh allen gabe davis and stefan diggs all had an amazing week uh in week five so again you can go two pass catchers you can go one pass catcher uh one to two teammates anything like that works so now we understand why stacking matters we understand what it does for us on a macro and a micro level next we have to talk one step further of week 17 stacking and correlation. Now, the way that most tournaments work, and we're going to be using the Pomeranian again, just an example. The Pomeranian is not even out. It just has a $3 entry point. I think it's just a, a really easy way to kind of show you guys. But we can see here how the ROI is going to work. And the average price for Advantage Round 2, so that's getting out of your original 12-person league. 
So advancing from weeks one through 14, your average prize is $4, which isn't a ton, right? It's like a 1.3x on your original $3 entry. You have your round three. So advancing from week 15 to week 16, your average prize is only $8. So that's 2.7x in your $3. But week four, or round four, week 17, is where all the ROI is. You have an average prize in week 17 of $83.86, which is 28 times that $3 intro. Um... It's crazy. So you can see everything is in that final week. 28x in your $3 entry where if you won, you know, first place in a $3 league, you get $20, which is a 5x. 28x just on the average. So you can see you want to be optimizing your team, prioritizing week 17 across the board. That's going to be in Pomeranians, Best Ball Mania. Every single one of these tournaments are built like this. Some of them have regular season prizes, but even still... All the money is in week 17. So if you draft, you know, Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, they play against the Patriots in week 17. So you should be, you should be drafting Tyquan Thorne or Mike Gusecki or a random Pierre Strong just to have a guy on the back end. So if the Bills score a ton of points and it becomes a shootout in week 17, you have a bunch of correlated outcomes. Where let's say you have Josh Allen to Diggs, and if the Bills score a bunch of points, maybe the Patriots have to pass more. So then you have Tyquan Thornton there, and he catches a bomb, and then boom, all of a sudden – you're cooking, right? So if it is one of those 18 leg parlays and nothing's correlated, then you have to like, you know, you're going to have players wrapped up in dud games where if your players are evenly spread out among all the games, there's going to be games where there's not a ton of points scored. Now, this is the BBM3 winners team. Uh, Pat Corain is also the creator of the legendary uh, upside running back article. He does great, great work. Um, but this is a team where he won $2 million. And you can see there's a lot of game stacking. I, I highlighted in pink. He had New England versus Miami last year. And last year, he also had uh, Carolina versus Tampa Bay, which I highlighted in blue. Uh, so you can see, right, Brady to Chris Godwin with a DJ Moore run back in that game, right? So again, if Tom Brady and Chris Godwin sync up and have a good game, then likely the Panthers are playing from behind. They have to pass the ball. Boom, that's how DJ Moore gets home. Then you have Tua, who didn't end up, you didn't end up using his points because Tom Brady ended up being the highest scoring quarterback that week. But you had Ramondre Stevenson in that game. You had uh, Raheem Moster in that game who did well. You have Jalen Waddell, Jacoby Myers as a bring back. You had Tyquan Thornton as a bring back, Mike Gusecki as a bring back. So Kareem almost like overstacked in a way where he had uh, he had Miami quarterback, Miami running back, Miami wide receiver, Miami tight end. So that's a, a triple stack there. And then he had a bring back uh, with New England running back, New England wide receiver, New England wide receiver, New England tight end. So he had he actually had four New England players as a bring back not even attached to his quarterback. So for anybody out there that thinks like overstacking is a thing or like correlation is dumb, like Kareem borderline overstacked his team here and he won it all. Now, I want to give a fat, fat disclaimer. <coughs> I do not care about the actual matchups in week 17. Like this year we have Chiefs Bengals, which everyone's gunning for. But these games that won Pat Kareem millions of dollars was Tampa Bay versus Carolina and New England versus Miami, which no one before the season was excited about. Um, and you had games like Chargers versus Rams put up less points than those two games, then Indianapolis versus the Giants, then Las Vegas versus San Fran, a couple of games that weren't as sexy preseason. So I wouldn't get caught up right now in like attacking certain Week 17 matchups. So much changes over an entire year. You should just be correlating things around what you've already drafted on your team. So if your team has a bunch of Seahawks, but you don't necessarily think that Seahawks versus Steelers is going to shoot out, who cares? You should be, you know, if you draft Geno to Metcalf to Noah Fant, you should have a Steelers run back of like Jalen Warren or something. There should be correlation there. It really doesn't matter in my eyes what, you know, a week 17 over under point total is uh, this far out. Now, this is where stacking without quarterback comes into play, right? Again, Kareem had, uh, you know, two, uh, Moster, Waddle, Gasecki. On the other side of that, you can have a stack without the quarterback, which again is that uh, New England. Or no, I'm an idiot for. I keep on mixing up Mike Gasecki on New England and Miami. Um, but the uh, New England part of the stack, Ramondre, Jacoby Myers, and Tyquan Thornton, three Patriots players, no quarterbacks. That's when you can kind of stack without the quarterback is when you get the game stuff involved. So the only time that I'm drafting teammates without their quarterback is if it's a week 17. Uh, set up so you could even uh, like this worked without Tua in the lineup right so even if you end up drafting your team like if this team was drafted without Tua I don't even mind that like sort of stacking you know three teammates versus t three teammates if they play in that final week now 
from a macro perspective, does the math check out? And this is a graphic from Mike Leone at Established to Run. He's been doing really, really good work. Again, I'm just pulling from people that are smarter than me. Um, I, I could never make these graphs or graphics or do the research. Um, but Leone did a really cool study on this where he, he compared your number of stacked quarterbacks and your number of game-stacked quarterbacks. So game-stacked quarterbacks are, you know, your team versus your opponent, whereas quarterbacks that are just stacked are just with their pass catchers, right? The game stacked is one step further, so you have somebody from the other side. And he tested it through all three rounds last year, and having one or more quarterbacks stacked increase your initial win rate. So you can see like zeros across the board are the ones that are below that, that line. Then you have the orange going above the line most of the time. Once you have like two to three quarterbacks stacked, uh, you have it going way up in that final. And you have purple, the one where it's game stacked, and you have that week 17 bring back. Or, I mean, like even further, Galaxy Brain is having a week 16 or week 15 bring back. I would prioritize 16 if it had to be one or the other because, you know, prioritizing to week 16, which is going to be the, the week that just gets you – like week 16 is borderline – uh, as important as week 17, because if you can optimize for that week, you it, just get yourself into the week 17 dance. Because again, even just the average prize there, or like last place um, in that final group on Best Ball Mania, you're still netting uh, a bunch of money just for being in that final dance. So I think that it's really interesting. We can quantify it. We can see it across the board, and it matters the most in week 17, right? Where you can see like the purple graph going way, way up. So helps you in the playoffs. It helps you across the board. Something to think about. Something that we proved helps, but the thing you need to worry about is ADP. I am begging you guys, do not reach. Do not reach the complete stacks. I rarely am reaching 10 to 12 players or 10 to 12 picks past ADP. I'm actually routining, scooping up whoever falls. There's no player that I hate enough on the draft board where if they fell 10 plus picks and I'm drafting, I'm scooping up whoever that is. Now, people love to say ADP doesn't matter. This is another gem uh, from Mike Leone that shows that it indeed does matter. He took the one, the top 100 teams from last year, and he compared them to 100 teams that most closely were around the 20th percentile, so the below average teams versus the elite teams, and he wanted to see you know, how much ADP value were each of these teams getting in their drafts. And you can see, and I, now I will say, I, I should probably explain this a little bit better, uh, he has ADP buckets, right? So ADP bucket one means that this, this team got loads of ADP value, right? A lot of their players are way past ADP. The, the way that I imagine he did this, this sample was just, you know, pick versus ADP, and then you just total that for an entire team, right? How much value did you get on ADP per draft? And then he buckets them, you know, as you go. And in the first bucket, you have 65 of top 100 teams were in the top ADP draft capital bucket, 83 within the top two buckets. So 83 of the top 100 teams were in the top two ADP value buckets. They're scooping up a lot of ADP value. They're getting steals. They're getting guys falling way past their ADP. And then you only have six elite teams that fell into the below average ADP draft capital bucket, which was six through 10, which is where all the bad teams reside. So people love to say ADP doesn't matter. This shows that the best teams are the ones that are routinely drafting players, you know, way past ADP and just scooping up the value and saying, you know what, let's just have a little humility. We don't know everything. I'll draft this player at a rare price that he doesn't usually go at in a normal draft. Now, reaching does make sense, though, in two instances. And it's all around the, the idea of uniqueness, right? There's two instances I think it's okay for you to reach, and neither of them are to make a stack. 470 teams made the, the Best Ball Mania playoffs last year. 193 of them had Justin Jefferson. 124 had Kirk Cousins. The most common stack was probably Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson. And if you had Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, it's tough to win it all because you have to beat out 100 other Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson teams. So you have to have the rest of your roster kind of differentiating for you. Now you can get lucky. Uh, Karain got lucky. He snuck in Tom Brady where Tom Brady sucked all year. And then he was the QB1 in fantasy in, in week 17. And he was on just eight of the final 470 teams. And we're talking about week 17, round four of the tournament, of Best Ball Mania, when it's just those 470 teams, you want teams that aren't owned. Now, on top of that, he had Taekwon Thornton. That probably wasn't even drafted in a lot of rooms and was on just 11 of the 470 teams. So he got a really nice rare combination there. And I think reaching to make your team unique so that when you get to the Week 17 dance, you have something that differenti differentiates yourself from all of the Jefferson teams or whoever ends up being the most common player, like it was Josh Jacobs until the final week. You want to have something that sort of sets you apart. Like the, you know, 
a skeleton key to 2021. What could have been was Cordero Patterson. He wasn't on a ton of teams, but if you somehow drafted Cordero Patterson, who was drafted on like, let's say like 5% of teams, you would have this massive, massive trump card once you got to week 17. And I think that Hayden Wings kind of outlines how to put this into action a lot better than I could. So Hayden Wings, this is a, uh, an article on Underdog Network that he kind of explained. To the left, you can see draft rate based on ADP. So, like, the higher your ADP is, you're getting drafted in, like, 100% of leagues or whatever. And then once you get to, like, 168-plus, it starts trailing off where players aren't getting drafted in every league, which means that if you draft those players, you can have a unique team that doesn't have players that are drafted in every single league. Now, the way that he says is the strategy I like best after looking at this data is targeting a player with an ADP in the 100 to 205 range in round 16. A player with an ADP of 195 projects basically as well as a player with an ADP of 175. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, of 175, but the drafted rate goes from 75 to 25%. So it's the same projection, but it's about a third of the rarity, if that makes sense, or three times the rarity. Uh, is what I would call it. And since players with an ADP of 190 to 205 largely go drafted already, I'm fine with stockpiling this range around 16, 17, and 18 rather than looking in the 0 to 1% drafted rate bucket of players who typically don't even get offensive staff. So what he's saying is, oh man, of course I have the wrong screenshot out. Um, but, and since players with an ADP of 190 to 205 largely go undrafted already, I'm fine with stockpiling this range around 16, 17, and 18 rather than looking in the 0 to 1% drafted rate bucket of players who typically don't even get offensive snaps. So what he's saying is there's a line you want to toe here because once you get, you know, sub 25% drafted in a league and you start digging into like 216, you know, type of ADP, these are players who aren't getting snaps and that's actually going to hurt your, your win rate. But if in rounds like 16 through 18, you're prioritizing those like 190 to 205 guys in ADP, that's good for making your team unique, even if you're reaching a little bit at the end of the draft. Now, he also outlines a different way to do this at the beginning of a draft in terms of getting unique. So, again, the lower the drafted rate here, the more unique your team is, and that gives you a leg up on the chalk, you know, the, the, the players that everybody comes into Week 17 with in these tournaments. Now, Hayden Winks made another cool graphic, but this is for Round 2, and he showed this uh, example last year where... He showed Austin Eckler, and we're just going to read through this real quick. He said, to no surprise, Austin Eckler was most commonly paired. So he was looking through 2021. Austin Eckler was really, really good, and he was drafted 12th overall. So that's what that black line is. And you can see drafted rate. So these are the players that he's most often drafted with in their ADP. And you can kind of see, right, every player, and this is at the 1-2 turn especially. The 1-2 turn is where he's saying you can get unique um, and have some fun with it. And this is the advice I'd give to you guys in terms of getting unique here. You can see... Every player that's around Austin Eckler, around that round 12 ADP, everybody who's closer to him is going to be paired with him more often just because of that's how ADP works. So he says, so no surprise, Eckler was most commonly paired with the players whose ADP were also near that round 1-2 turn. Nick Chubb, Calvin Ridley, Aaron Jones, and Stephon Diggs. The question is, if it's smarter to keep drafting these common pairings or if it's better to get slightly more unique by drafting different players at the round 1-2 turn. The most minus EV move for the Eckler teams is to draft a consensus round 1 player who just happened to fall as these players... Oh, no, the most plus EV move for Eckler team is to draft the consensus round 1 player who just happened to fall as these players both project best and were uniquely paired with Eckler. For example, Tyree Kill was only paired with Eckler 4% of the time because Hill, ADP 8.1, rarely fell far enough to be at the turn, commonly paired with Eckler at a 12.1 ADP. So it's probably best to draft consensus top 12 players in ADP together whenever possible. Of course, but that makes a lot of sense. Like if, if I'm at the, 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 at the 112 this year and say, you know, AJ Brown falls there, I'm taking him no matter what. Um, if you get to that one, two turn and you have the option to draft two players of the top 12 ADP that go in the first round of the draft, you absolutely should. Because again, they both project really well and it's a way to get unique because it's a rare pairing, right? Where these two players usually don't fall to this range. Now, the next thing that you can do to get weird, assuming nobody falls to you, he says, the actual debate is whether to pair Nick Chubb, ADP of 13.8, and Calvin Ridley, or Najee Harris with Eckler. All right, so these are ADPs of 13.8, 16.2, 18.9. The projections between Chubb, Ridley, and Harris going into last season were all basically the same, but Eckler was paired with Chubb 12.5% of the time compared to 3.8% of the time with Harris. If you're looking for unique pairings that don't sacrifice too many points, then draft a round 1-2 turn player with a player who is commonly drafted 17th to 24th overall. So, that is the next way to get unique, right? Where I'm actually going to pull up the uh, underdog ADP right now. Uh, but if you were to go on underdog and you were to draft a team, and I think like 12th overall is going to be like Garrett Wilson. It's going to be uh, Devontae Adams. So let's say we take Devontae Adams at 12th overall here. We could pair him with 
uh, somebody in like that 17 range. So you could go like Devonta Adams, Chris Olave is probably a, a rare pairing, or Devonta Adams, Devonta Smith, or Devonta Adams, Patrick Mahomes um, gets a little bit weird too. So that's a way where you can sort of uh, get unique. You can even take it one step further, where let's say you go Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, Tony Pollard. So it's a unique pairing that's also stacked in Week 17 because you have Cowboys versus Detroit. Um, <clears throat> So there's a lot that you can kind of get there. But again, that's really in the weeds and something that's not super, super important. I just wanted to contextualize certain times where I would consider uh, reaching on a player. Now, the other notes that I had for this video just in terms of things that people ask me about, uh, bye weeks. To be honest with you, when it comes to running backs and wide receivers, I do not care at all about bye weeks as long as there's no week where I can't start minimum two running backs and three wide receivers, right? So as long as you don't have your entire unit overlapping and you can field a, a team every single week, you're fine. I really only care about quarterback, right? Because quarterback scores the most points in this format. You can't take a zero there by having everybody having the same bye week. I think you can get away with it with tight end. But with quarterback, that's the one position where I won't have overlapping bye weeks unless if I'm drafting three quarterbacks. Now, I think everything we went over today is summed up really well. Uh, from this Justin Herzig graphic. So I wanted to show it here. He works at Established to Run. I think Established to Run has some of the best uh, underdog, best ball tournament type uh, content. And he kind of puts it really well in terms of what he's thinking through. Roster construction at the very base of what he's doing. Stay within general parameters to not over or underspend at a position. Two to three quarterbacks, four to seven uh, running backs, seven to nine wide receivers, two to three tight ends. I think it's a little bit looser than that. I think I said two to three quarterbacks, two to four tight ends. Uh, Four to seven running backs probably right, but I would say probably like six to 11 wide receivers you could get away with. Uh, after that, his next most important thing is stacking. Now, I would include positional capital with roster construction anyway, but he doesn't. Uh, next most important thing is stacking. Make bets on teams, uh, increases your correlation and limits how much you need to get right. One to three pass catchers and or one to two running backs, usually up to three per team. Uh, then you care about average draft position. So the goal is to draft ADP value either according to real-time ADP or their eventual closing ADP at the beginning of the season. So that's like drafting closing line value, right? Where Brees Hall, maybe you take him a bunch in the third round right now, but you think in August ACL uh, news is going to get better and he's going to end up being a top 18 pick. So you can kind of stash that now and gain that closing line value. But most of the time your ADP value uh, is going to be just from players falling in your drafts. And you have player takes, of course, which is just how you feel on players, you know, player rankings, your own takes, uh, sharp player bets, hardest to predict, but meaningful positional capital. Make sure uh, your team tells a story and draft positions accordingly. So again, budgeting your team, budgeting quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, either quality early, quantity late. But again, I would, I would lump that in with roster construction. And then I would lump week 17 with stacking in general, but week 17 is game stacking. So that's at the very, very tippy, tippy top. So again, this is a good sort of example of like, you should really just be thinking roster construction slash positional capital stacking, ADP, and then everything from there is kind of the cherry on top. Now, the last thing that I want to kind of give you guys is I think this is a really, really good foundation, this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Like, let me know if this helped. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions that I can kind of cover in live streams and stuff. Um, but I kind of just want to direct you guys down the road because I assume anybody who's, you know, using my promo code, which, by the way, if you are just, like, new to Underdog and you found this video and you're like, what the heck is Ron talking about, use promo code Ron. You hop on Underdog. I outline the entire thing in this video. If you want to help support the boy, Use promo code RON when you try Underdog for the first time. I'll have a link in the description, a link at the top of the comment section down below. You click the link. It'll take you to Underdog. It'll use my promo code RON, and it will match your first deposit up to $100. Now, again, I assume that a lot of you guys that are new using my promo code are like, man, like, where do I even start? How do I even play all this? So I hope that this was a nice beginner's guide, you know, 101 handbook of what the heck you guys need to know to play in these Underdog streets. Now, from here, where do you guys go next? I wanted to give you guys... Um, some resources if you want uh, more information on best ball, if you just kind of want to be a sponge and listen to people that I'm listening to. Uh, first, this channel will be streaming drafts weekly. I'm working on it right now. Uh, I think we're going to do weekly draft streams uh, this summer. I think end of August, we're going to get really crazy and do almost daily. But I think starting July through uh, week one, I want to do a morning show uh, Tuesday, like 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And then do a Thursday night show, 8 p.m. Eastern. So be on the lookout for that. I think we're going to have a, a stable, you know, very serious uh, bi-weekly stream schedule or two-time-a-week stream schedule. You can always hop in there, hop in the chat, ask me questions while I'm drafting, see what I'm doing while I'm drafting, watch me draft, kind of learn from it, hop in the draft rooms, uh, you know, bounce ideas off of other people in the chat room, and just kind of talk about overall strategy, player takes, all of that good stuff. Um, I think ship chasing... Uh, I think Pete Overzet 
they all do good stuff over there ship chasing adp chasing that's all in the ship chasing channel Karain's on there he won bbm last year i think that he's a really good guy um to draw ideas from uh pete overs that does drafts like he does streams i think like so many times a week he has his schedule out there i think overs that's one of the big ones to watch he's won um i think that he's finished top 10 in best mania i think Karain has finished first place so they're both guys uh to soak up information from he even has sean siegel on uh every week like I, I find it kind of routine viewing to watch uh or listen to him draft a seagull and Karain. i think anything from established to run is really good they have herzig over there who is really really good uh they cover a ton of best ball stuff jack miller's over there is great uh i like sam sherman and his threads on uh twitter he works or not works but he's on adp chasing which is on ship chasing all the time um and then i would say of course like underdog fantasy the channel right where you have like hayden winks and josh norris they're talking through a lot of uh best ball specific stuff as well so i'm trying to think anybody else off my head that makes really really good uh best ball content that i also consume but i think that that is it now i appreciate you guys sticking around here again um this was a video for anybody out there that is new to underdog fantasy or sort of new to underdog fantasy wants to get more involved so let me know was this was this video helpful was it too confusing where do you go next um let me know any best ball questions down below and i'll hope to get to them but hope you guys enjoyed and as always, I will see you guys in the next one.